800. Heute geht es um, uh, hardware Trojaner in security this chips. talk is about also hardware trojans in security chips die, uh, so not the software kind of trojans that the police is using the guys next to me peters and marcus have been researching for years on smart cards and both work for infineon but they're here on the private notice okay welcome them <laughs> ja, vielen Dank und herzlich Thank you very much and welcome to our talk on hardware trojans and security chips. As promised, we immediately go to the dark side. We first want to introduce ourselves. Um, thank you for the introduction. We have been active in this area since 1989. We've been working on uh, chip cards. We started in Brunsbüttel, a small city pretty close to here, on the German telephone card. It was pretty new and uh, we always wanted to know what happens with all the gold wires in the card. Are the, the credits stored on the card? Around 1991, so two years later, we have held our first talk on the CCC. This was a lot smaller than here, but it was already a lot of fun. In our uh, studies in university, uh, he was in Hamburg, I was in Kiel. We continued working on this topic and we found one or two leaks and we've been researching on that topic ever since. As already announced, we are still working in that area professionally. Among others, at uh, a semiconductor manufacturer called Infineon, but we still do private research. At the moment, we're interested in the surplus market for equipment with which we do uh, research and also try to manufacture strong tools. And now we uh, start with the next subject, the hardware Trojans. Hard software Trojans are well known, everybody knows about them, so we want to talk more about the hardware Trojans. They are um, usually overlooked, especially in the uh, literature and also in the public. Hardware Trojans also have two aims. The first to exfiltrate data and also to infiltrate things. Exfiltrate is something everybody thinks about. So if you have a software Trojan and he wants to have um, credit card numbers, so he wants to get them out of the system. Or also the uh, Bundes Trojans um, who export private data into the systems of the uh, police. There are also other things that might be exfiltrated. For example, cryptographical keys. When you have encrypted data news on the system and you watch them, you may want to look at the key on the on the chip to uh, decrypt the data afterwards. Or even worse, uh, the uh, receipts for random number generators. Nowadays, random numbers are not really random. They are not really purely random, but they are used with seed numbers and you run pseudo-random num pseudo -random number generators with that. If you know the pseudo-random number generator and the seed value, you will know which is the next random number. And that can be used to harm uh, encryption. And otherwise, it can also be software if you want to extra code and run code dump on them. Something that is all not uh, looked at more often is infiltration. So a Trojan infiltrates a system that is reasonably well known in software, so to in introduce malware is something a Trojan may be used for, but also other data or parameters can be infiltrated. Wrong parameters for industrial uh, computers or well-known 
bad security values. If a system uses a an encryption method that is known for the attacker, that's also interesting. And furthermore, uh, there are also ethical problems about that. The compromise, the date, uh, the evidence against a company or a person might be also put onto the systems and people who use the system or maybe cross a border with it might have b might get real big problems by that. Also, next to Trojans, there are also the words backdoor and backdoor. So sometimes they are mixed up. So here we want to talk about those those words, what's uh, what they are about. Uh, they are always. You can always think about them as a on the historical background of the uh, Trojan do uh, horse. So it's a vehicle with a uh, payload. So the, uh, car, uh, the the door opens, the soldiers go in, and the users get uh, the door into their system. Like, hey, cool! It's a free app. It's a free horse in this case, and once it's inside the city or the uh, system, the payload t turns off the security features or the guards and then opens the door for the rest of the army. And that's the back door. The Troy train horse moves and controls the back door. So that was the real use of it. But nowadays it's often misused, so we won't be that strong about it. Another word is the bug door, coming from bug and door. It's just bad programming. Uh, for example, bad Backdoors in a software that are that have been used by a developer to do to change do changes, but they have never been removed. And there are few, there are many of those. There is another question: Where can those trojans or backdoors be found? S where are they from? Uh, the most important thing about them is that trojans always work in the system. The system is where the trojans do their work, no matter where they are from. Sometimes they even switch their places. The system always, or the systems we talk about, is always made up by software and hardware. In the software, the programming of a Troy is quite simple. And everybody who knows something about programming is able to, if you work sufficiently long about it, it to write a Troy. And it's not that hard to implement it. However, there's also a disadvantage. They are usually easy to find. Everybody who can disassemble the software and try to understand the software, he will notice that something is wrong there. And once he finds that, he can really relatively simple <coughs> prove what the Troy is actually doing. So there are works and uh, papers about how to find out what Troyes do and how they work. Other was hardware Troyes is different. Not only the hardware is changed, but also the software itself. It's software is changed, but also the hardware itself. For example, the chip is changed. The functionality of a chip is different and to, to implement it, it's really hard, it's quite expensive and it's not that easy to hide compared to others in the development of those devices, but on the other hand, the attacker has advantages. For example, the identification is really quite hard. If you have a hardware drawing and really want to identify it, you have to usually reverse engineer a chip and look at the chip really carefully. And even if you do that, sometimes the question, is a certain hardware function what does it really do? Is it really active or is it maybe just a sleeping functionality that has never been used and will never be used? And therefore the proof is quite complicated. So, how to, uh, when we want to look at how hard it is to create a hardware trial, we have to first of all look at uh, how uh, these chips are created. Uh, once you know how these chips are created, you can look at where you can 
Und hier put in a try. Train. Gezeigt, so here, basically, how will trip is created? In the left, it begins with the hardware description language, in this case, VHDL. Uh, VHDL is a programming language like for software, however you write directly hardware like uh, program in, uh, and it has the function what the uh, the hardware should do, maybe a CPU. If you've used an FPGA, you know that quite well. Once the VHDL, when the code is ready, you put it like software code into a compiler and the compiler creates a layout. The, all the functionalities are connected with each other like a normal uh, layout for a PCB and... Oh, that's the second step, sorry. It's first compiled and then turned into a layout. and that the layout shows how how the how it's all connected and that's what's similar to a printed circuit board the different colors are metal um, lines of different layers once you're there and you really what you want to create a chip you have to create it into an uh, turn it into an optical system you see um, some masks here Ma masks are quartz glass slides, and on these quartz glass slides, chrome is, is put on, and there are small structures inside of it, and that's an optical mask to create the single layers of a chip in a raw silicium crystal. You need a dozen of so masks, and when you've used them off one after the other, you create the wafer, and on the wafer there are all the chips, and you only have to solve that apart or use lasers to take it apart to get these simple single chips. It's of course the question, uh, where is the Trojan hidden? That means we see here that there are way more steps to create um, the software, uh, the hardware instead of the software. So there are way more possibilities to implement the Trojan. So, um, and it's really the possibility that you can implement a Trojan in every step of the um, pr uh, of the process. Uh, you can implement it in VHDL, in, in layout, or in uh, in the mask. So, what can you do in the in the layout? Um, in uh, uh, VHL DL and there's um, the function uh, written out so I can just add a couple of lines of code um, to add the Trojan functionality that means a Trojan can be directly Im implemented in VHDL um, uh, it can be directly implemented and then be moved uh, into into the layout in, in the mask and then in the hardware um, part um, you see the implementation is pretty easy in that step, but also uh, it's pretty easy to find if you review the code, um, if you look at the functions and what the code is actually doing. So pretty much everybody will find it. And on top of that, um, the VHL code has, uh, is being processed and reviewed in, by a, a bunch of people, and so the chance increases that, that it's going to be found. Um, so if you now write a VHL code without a Trojan, then you can add in the a step of the layout the Trojan. Um, you, s you see in the sample um, the um, electric wire up uh, in the different colors, and with a a uh, special layout program, we can add, uh, uh, um, we can move the electrical connections and add new elements to it and change the elementary, uh, the wire so, so a Trojan is implemented. Um, by looking at this, you see it's a lot harder to implement a Trojan on th this step because you have to change a lot of r parts. And it's nothing you do something like on the side and we just add a couple lines of code. It's a really hard work and you have to work a lot. But um, the advantage of that um, is that you have the um, really small chance that somebody will uh, discover it because who looks at the layout. So um, um, when you form from the layout to, to the mask, you can also add in the mask a the Trojan. So when you add s structures on, on, on the mask, um, uh, which are going to 
build the product, um, you can add there um, and then a couple um, things that implements a Trojan. Um, you, you can use this, of course, is uh, a bit of a problem. But you can't just scratch the code into the masks. What you have to do is you, you basically have to create them from scratch. And seeing that, it's obviously a lot harder than it was on the step before. And you, you cannot just change the code. You also need the tools to actually create this. So still, the detection of the Trojan is actually a lot harder. It's pretty hard to actually check the masks itself. You have to verify by comparing it with the layout and what would be generated from that and hope that it hasn't changed in the meantime. So, yeah, the detection is actually pretty hard. So those con this concludes the methods of how to implement the Trojan in hardware. But you can also see the, the detection is only normally, or in the, in the usual case, easy, middle or hard, because there are certain situations that we call the snake oil cases where uh, uh, introducing a Trojan is harder or easier, or rather easy to, to introduce and hard to detect. Um, snake oil is something that uh, should that is praised as having uh, good characteristics and that don't uh, that that could have a dangerous side effect that you can't really uh, see through and um, you you put this in w good wittingly um, hoping that it has some good natured effect but you cannot oversee the side effects maybe these features also have very small side effects in the uh, process of production. So let's have a look at what happens if you add it at the very beginning of the process. Let's say that this uh, VHDL code is not short, but rather pretty complex, and where you add a piece that you cannot really see through. It's not something you can just read. Of course, it's a lot easier here to just add new functionality that you wouldn't expect. So obviously, the detection, given the complexity of the code, is also a lot harder. Is this only theory? Is this only theory? Well, from the software world, we know the white box cryptography. This already uses the most complex software code you can have in order to hide cryptographic keys in a piece of software. And you try to hide them in the best way possible using white box cryptography. The codes in there are so complex that you can't really understand them anymore. So if we transfer this to the hardware, this might also be possible. What if, if the VHDL code is a lot more complex than we basically show it? Uh, looking through these um, complex functions is, of course, harder. And therefore, it's easier to introduce Trojans that are harder to detect. Even if it's not at the very beginning of the processing chain, but rather later, they can still make it easier to introduce it. Begünstigen, dass man zu einem späten Prozessschritt entsprechend noch Veränderungen vornimmt. So that you can make changes later. Maybe they just help with the introduction. Let's say we have a snake oil feature being put into the VHDL code that is supposed to make the chip act safer. But maybe it actually, in reality, helps with um, adding a new mask set to uh, compromise the chip in a way that you can control them easily. What could this look like? Well, a practical example would be the physically unclonable functions. They have a high risk of being manipulated. With the physically unclonable functions, with the SRAM physically unclonable functions that uses internal memory, 
Zellen eher einige it could, eher nach 0 when turning on, eher die uh, nach 1 haben. make das some of the cells um, tend ab. to flip also their content to zero or to one. Hier wird. So bei jedem Einschalten wieder das gleiche Muster it would do the same thing on every uh, booting of the system. Abzuleiten. And you have a reproducible pattern, and you can try to um, deduce cryptographic keys from this behavior. This, uh, um, this is e easily uh, manipulable if you add a mask in the um, manufacturing process. You can add with them. Uh, you can change the SRAM uh, bytes with a special math, um, so they. Uh, you uh, manipulate the probability that they flip to zero or one. Um, and the change is that I know what is more likely and uh, somebody that looks at the chip and doesn't know that I manipulated it doesn't know about it. And that shows how complicated it is to find such Trojans. A uh, similar method is um, when you, uh, it's called camouflage chip designs. It's not um, a um, normal um, uh, cell. Uh, it's a logical um, element in in the layout. Um, it's it, it's built into the into the layout into the layout and is. Uh, can be uh, defined later on in the process. Um, the same is with the is with the it's with the programming. If the programming just happens in the last step with the mask, you can uh, later on add another mask and change the usability as is uh, uh, how the chip works, so that your Trojan is inside of there. So next to the normal ways. You can implement a Trojan in, into a chip. Many more exist, like the snake oil features make the introduction significantly easier, and sometimes they're really hard to detect. Sometimes you think, hey, the hardware Trojan sometimes has to co communicate with the outside world. Well, we see there are many, many backdoors that can be used to communicate. For example, in protocols or in side channels that might usually escape to side channel attacks, purposefully exports information. Otherwise, it might be chip uh, modification, so physically change the chip or fault introductions. These many ways you, the backdoors can be used or started. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, so we'll talk about a few of them. Here we have, we, we chose uh, some examples that are publicated because we don't want to uh, hint the security services on these new informations, but we want to show you how these protocols can be misused to exfiltrate data. The best known Oh, you also know why software trojans is to is that undocumented um, orders or orders are accepted or a general key is integrated. So uh, with, by that, uh, the data of the code cannot be isn't that secure. Another method well known from the security if from the software way is bad cryptography cryptographic um, algorithm so they know which backdoors are chosen and he knows how to choose that cryptography uh, the, how to attack them so he, kn he knows how to extract the se secret keys and knows how to read the internal data another scenario which has not been uh, communicated that well is watermarking. Watermarking everybody knows, for example, from videos or images or audio files. When they are transmitted, there is a s is it says where the file is from, but what happens if the chip or, uh, can, uh, if it exfiltrates a large amount of data and a watermarking, steganography, adds additional information in the output. If anybody who does not know how to get these data out of it will never find out whether that 
the normal data or maybe there are a few chips changed in uh, bits changed inside of it over which information is exfiltrated from the chip and especially this knowledge is what's uh, changed by with uh, side channel attacks for example if i look at the power profile or the electromagnetic um, emissions i can simply see Yes, that chip looks pretty random. Or, oh, that looks like maybe that's due to the functionality. However, somebody who ha has implemented this backdoor specifically knows that at certain times the power uh, usage of the electromagnetic field has to be looked at and knows and figures out how the inf informations can be seen. For example, the amplitude, how much power was used, or how much electromagnetic fields was um, emitted. So it's quite hard to see, to notice that there's additional information. Even more complicated is with light uh, emissions. You might know that if a transistor change is switched 10 to 1,000 times, also a photon is pr created, an infrared photon, and you can measure it or record it with special cameras so you know where is activity in a chip, where are there a lot of transistors that switch. However, if you have a special, special backdoor, you could manipulate an element that it sends photons more often or more interesting you know exactly at which point where is the transistor that i have to look at and morse information like with the torch uh, the data outside Exact the same way you can measure the the signal uh, level on different lines maybe you have listened at our, to our chip 25 years chip card attacks with an electronic raster microscope you can read the signals on different lines so if you look at the complete chip and you can see a lot of signals on different um, uh, lines but someone who may use this line specifically may have put a line in an upper layer and he knows all the significant data runs through this one line and he can read all the data on this line and with an electron beam and he can that by exfiltrate all the data into an analyzing system how many different ways there are is that even the temperature can be used here there's also new sources that at a multi-core system at one ship there uh, at one processor there's a lot of work and the work on the other core is changed or influenced there's even a publication where two pcs run next to one another at one pc there's a lot of calculation and at the other the internal uh, the temperature sensor is monitored and you can see without con uh, without having contact to the other move data of course that's really really slow because the temperature m changes really slow you may get a couple of bits per second however even so some side channels like that can be used even more interesting are manipulating backdoors. Who doesn't know that in a chip, if you look at it, maybe there are not just the connected pins, but even additional contacts, where the, in the data sheet it just says NC or non-connected or uh, for, for future use. And nobody knows what's behind them, if they're really not connected or maybe a future uh, functionality, maybe a debug method or other functionalities uh, you can communicate with the chip over. And those contacts, and not only those contacts can be used, but also in the implementation you might create a special line on the chip and if you remove it with a laser beam, that can also be bought on a used hardware market quite cheaply. You can enable the additional functionality and suddenly only after the manipulation 
after the physical manipulation, the chip can be communicated with. And even memory cells like the RAM, we ta just talked about the physical and cloudable functions, can be used by ion implementation or changed using ion implementation or changed the functionality of the, f uh, of the chip. In the last case, um, error induction can also be used to communicate with the drawing through the back door and give him information. For example, you could turn on, uh, shine a laser on different functions or in different elements, and in the end it's just a, da uh, just a uh, solar cell. So the laser creates a small amount of power in the chip and switch something on or off. You just cannot connect to this functionality from the outside without knowing exactly where to point the laser to. What is uh, known um, widely is that um, memory is um, added with safety features. Um, when you download something um, on, on a microcontroller, um, a safety bit is set, and so it, uh, it is um, meant that you can't get the information out of the memory chip. Now, if you're the designer, you may be now where you um, can shine the ultraviolet uh, light to deactivate um, the safety bit and to then access the backdoor. It's possible that this is actually a backdoor, so just bad design or just, just a mishap. But it could also be on purpose as a backdoor. So the designer knows exactly that if I want this particular piece of data, I have to uh, delete this particular cell and memory with UV light in order to get the data out. Uh, very uh, interesting, but also pretty complicated uh, issue is the random number generation. They are used for uh, securing cryptographic functions, and it needs randomness. It needs to uh, to randomize the behavior of the algorithm, but it, of course this can't work if from the outside you can influence the way uh, this random number generator works or if you can actually set particular val values. It's possible, for example, that if you put on a electromagnetic field or a radio frequency and change the internal uh, random number generation that you can have particular values as output or just have at least predictable numbers. There's, if someone knows exactly how this backdoor works, then you can just use it to uh, defeat the randomness and therefore have predictable random numbers. We know that often they introduce sensors. Uh, they're meant to help against uh, certain things like uh, detecting uh, light radiation or similar things. And who says that they just uh, they cover the whole spectrum and the whole the whole space around the object and not just part of it where it's so that you have a blind spot where you cannot detect what is going on. This could be used in order to uh, have uh, implantation of errors and particular values. You can already see um, around the topic of backdoors, there's a lot of different methods that you can use to implement them in hardware, a lot more than you can have in the software. There is different ways of communicating, different ways of getting data out, implementing them, an especially grave uh, problem is the the interfaces for analysis or debugging, they're actually meant to uh, do some analysis on the hardware. For example, here there's a, 
a backdoor or a, 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 an interface for detecting how the hard drive is broken or if it's broken anyway, maybe you can fix it by uh, flashing a new firmware. But obviously you can misuse it in order to get data directly out or adding firmware, uh, adding Trojans into the firmware. Even bigger is the, the area of the JTAG ports that you have on a lot of devices and that are usually not secured in any way. For example, here you have a, a wireless LAN router um, where you can just flash a new firmware with a Trojan onto the board by using the JTAG. If you think a little further, what happens if you have a, if a security ship, like a TPM module or something, and you have a JTAG interface? Of course, if the, the chip actually fails, then you can try to repair it or at least get back the data that I put in. But obviously, that's exactly what you wouldn't want. A security chip should please keep the data safe and not just make them accessible again on the port. So, especially on security chips, uh, analysis interfaces, are, or especially JTAG pods, are a really bad idea. So, we now show you how uh, you can actually have this implemented on an easy to understand example. This is uh, a small uh, kind of telescopic a device in a door. You can have a look through it and see who is on the outside. You, before you open the door, you look through it and you, you see, do you know the person or not? So obviously this is a good thing to have, but it can also be abused. For example, in the fourth picture, if you put on a special kind of optic device to reverse the mechanism, so you don't just see a very small point, but rather because of this optics you use, you can actually spy into the whole room behind it. Who's in the flat? Who is there? Uh, is there someone? What does it look like? This is uh, a good example, or at least we think so, how a pretty well-meant feature could actually be used as a backdoor. In the 90s, end of the 90s, it was pretty clear that some time after the software Trojans, the hardware Trojans would come. And during that time, we already made a, or collected some ideas of what you could do in order to uh, minimize the risk and prevent them from happening. We tried to prove the hardware to make it safe. In order to get closer to the actual issues, we tried to think about what are the reasons that you would want to put this in for, and uh, is it on purpose or not? And we have four categories. Uh, the first one is uh, malicious intent. You see on the first picture, during uh, when you have malicious intent, of course you first think about sabotage, blackmail, um, political motives. For example, a f system is already in the field and the uh, manufacturer is being blackmailed that with a certain command, you could just make them fail or something. But it could also be political motives, like, for example, a dictator wants to take a closer look at his uh, subjects and just monitor their communication. And in order to do that, he would introduce the Trojan. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the the, the good intent, they still do it on purpose. Well, we already think about service interfaces, debugging, maybe even customer support. For example, customer support asking you, well, do you want this stuff to be repaired for you or maybe we can get your data out. Of course, also here, there's political intent. Of course, now we have to replace the mean dictator by maybe a good monarch who wants to protect his citizenship. Then we have two more categories. They are not on purpose or there's no active, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't done on purpose. 
we call them ignorance and idiocy. We separated them on purpose. With the ignorance, the intention is, or the, the, the consequences are at least partially known when you're doing the design. It could be, for example, you're being pressed for time and you don't have the time to just take the debugging interface out. You know that it's not secured, but you don't have the time, so you just leave it in. Yeah, well, of course, you, you try to rationalize it for yourself, then yeah, it's not going to be that bad. You just leave it in. Or someone tells you that you have to do it, and you just don't think about it. You, you don't speak up, but you just trust the person who says, leave it in. And then the last one is idiocy. We, we used a pretty harsh word for it, but it wasn't... We just wanted to make uh, clear, um, we call it uh, subjects, uh, no, functional idiocy. The, the systems we build these days are pretty complex, and there's in, in part even hundreds and more uh, developers that work together, and no one knows quite exactly how they all work together and how the, the cocks fit in the system. It's it's often not known, and there's blind spots. And we have already shown ways where a pretty good idea actually has really bad, um, it leads really bad problems. Another interesting point is what can we do about that? And here we also looked at some three categories. So first, to talk uh, communicate it. With a, um, a, to force them externally or internally. And here with the green and gray sides, you can see how uh, helpful they are. The first one is, um, is the uh, teaching. So it really h it helps with stupidity and ignorance, but against bad intentions, it doesn't help at all if you say someone, hey, that's a really bad idea about the uh, to do that at the company, uh, and if the says in the separator will put it in, but it, that's really important. The technology uh, in technology technological um, purposes is independent of what the person the, the the attacker wants. It makes it harder to implement backdoors and uh, toys generally, but on the left and the right side uh, we did not put it there completely because those tools are with, with intention and if someone really wants to do it, he will look at which technological, uh, technological measures are used and tries to figure out how to circumvent those, uh, those security features. And in the last case, the, the uh, uh, to require them to do it properly, um, internally or externally or everybody himself, and they are they have quite differently important. Um, it sometimes works more or less good. But here, some more information about the possibilities. What can everybody do? Who Ha, is in part of one of these areas in the implementation or the analyzing or the, 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 the testing. So first, teach them, teach them about the technical e e e e features. Security should always be a feature. Uh, debugs if uh, interfaces are not good for security chips, they mustn't be used. Not for your own development or error checking, they they don't fit in. And last but not least, developers usually don't think like hackers. They are constructive. They've con uh, and that means that usually your own results, you look at, and you look at them and you really trust them. And an attack or a security or pen trust is assumed as an attack on this, the own person. Everybody who 
works in the IT security area knows that in, that you have to create a constructive atmosphere where you work to the betterment of the product. Political aspects are also an aspect. Here, uh, the Frankenstein effect, if you actually have a trying in the praxis, it's uncontrollable. You don't know what's going to happen about it, who's going to use it. it uh, and sometimes it's even about the person who really is it. In political, in the, in the history book, we see that political situations can change. In this case, it's not that important but in, in one country, but if, a, uh, if it's sold in different countries, maybe one of those might get, get a different leader in the next month or years. And furthermore, there are the ethical aspects. Backdoors can bring per people in death deadly uh, danger, especially if you think about compromats, where someone with top secret information they have on their keys and they're thereby connected, uh, stopped at the border, then that's a real problem. And as always, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, so, there are some technological help against Trojans and backdraws that can be used prophylactic. So, first of all, don't use technologies that may be used within backdraws. If you notice them, or if you notice that a technology uses it, uh, that might be used for backdoors, don't use it in security chips. Furthermore, the design must be cho cho chosen in such a way that changes appear, that if someone changes uh, something, it will be noticed that something is wrong. Because the changes that have to be done are larger than what you normally would have with their snake oil in the design. There are similar things in the about technological, uh, about teaching them with te about technology. There are also two other options. First of all, self-test of chips, and furthermore, the recognition of the chips is manufactured with a self-chip uh, test. It might be reasonably helpful. Uh, so, a chip before there is a really critical uh, chip. Um, it runs a test operation and checks whether everything is all right, whether the chip is not ma uh, the 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 um, uh, the keys are not changed. And after all these chips, the tests are run. The chip only after all these uh, checks are done, the chip will do its own uh, the security relevant uh, thing. Uh, but these might be um, also interfered by an uh, internal uh, person. S but that makes it much more important and you may need more people, which is also always a problem. With the finding, uh, by looking at them afterwards, uh, we are more skeptical. Sometimes uh, others have looked at it and they looked at maybe the power consumption curves uh, of the chip, but you have to be really careful about that. Usually. The spectros are created in such a way that they are not always active, and furthermore, especially with, with security chips and security hardware, the uh, power consumption is chosen randomly to reduce the chance of power uh, analysis attacks. Therefore, the develop the, the, the recognizing uh, to recognize a manipulation on a ready chip is really hard. There is another option. And it's also creative is to make everybody sign that they will not create a backdoor. Uh, for example, nowadays you see that people who want to create such a chip look at who creates them, who what history they may have, who is, owns the company, where is the main seat of the company uh, located how um, can other parties inf influence these companies and it's really good to see that um, furthermore laws and rules the data protection laws are quite nice but who who controls them and who who looks that everything is done according to those laws and you have to 
sh with the reality. Where are they value in space or in a different country? And furthermore, the self. Uh, um, uh, that's not that bad. The creator hims uh, the the uh, co company that creates the chips promises not to create uh, to create backdraws and trojans what happens there is that there is an additional problem if the uh, chip creator al although he promised not to change it uh, to to inc implement backdraws it will have negative consequences for him and that additional risk, economical risk, is that the developer himself within in the development processes will look at it more closely that no backdrops are created or just happen. So the tests might be better or the evaluations are better. So the influence, it, it's harder to influence it. So that's all good, but why should a uh, uh, creator go towards that risk? But nowadays, even there, the situation changes. It changes slowly. The developers, the the uh, manufacturers who go ahead with that, ha sometimes have more chip cells. But of course, there's always the question. Um, what uh, producers um, and manufacturers are doing that, and we're hoping that more will follow and commit to that cause. So we come to the end of our presentation. We have a couple of book recommendations and literature recommendations. We here have a couple um, um, books from 1991 from Computers and Trojans, um, where there's talk about Trojans and the concepts uh, of, of them. And there's also one from December um, where everyone can check, that everybody can check out who got time. Uh, with that, we want to uh, wish you um, lots of fun uh, for your own research. And we're open for questions. And tomorrow, we're going to be at our assembly. And everybody that wants to come by and talk uh, uh, with us, we're open to it. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. Um, you heard there are a couple minutes to ask your questions. Please line up at the microphones. Everyone that leaves, please be quiet. Are there any questions? There's one. Ah, dort hinten erkenne ich jemanden an Mikrofon drei. At microphone three. Okay, so I want to ask, um, you can secure software really, really good uh, it, by proving that it fits the specifications. Are there any um, movements or uh, programs that enforce that for the hardware level? Yeah, of course, there's the attempt to see if there's a, a non-intentional feature and there's different answers but to be fair it's pretty tough to be complete about the whole process as we already saw during the manufacturing process at the very end um, during the masking set where you can only check the mask or the finished product this is pretty tough it's very hard to actually try and figure out if that's the intention. Yes, there are different answers, but Thank you. by no means they're complete. Microphone uh, 4, please. Hey, I have the question, what is the work that you have to do um, if you w want to inject a mask into the application process, what has a single developer to do? Um, I th in my imagination, it's really, really difficult to um, add another structure in, in, into different lasers um, that you would um, uh, w that, you, that when you create something in your mask that you inject, that you influence other layers. 
Ähm, ja, also als Antwort vielleicht. Ja, yeah, well, ähm, bei der der Trojaner, uh, trying to avoid Trojans. Geht, das ist the, the further you go towards the mask, the harder it gets. The more effort you have to put in. And of course, if you if you put it in into the VHDL at the very beginning, and that is very easy. The further you go in the production process, the harder it gets. And the, the tricky bit is you have to avoid technologies that make it easy to uh, tamper with the design. For example, think about the RAM cells. The RAM cell doesn't really care if uh, the driver of the cell is a little stronger or a little weaker. They just work. So for example, if you use the physically unclonable functions and try to deduct something from the memory cell, it, you won't notice this, uh, that someone has manipulated, but if it's something vital that the chip actually uses and that may never go wrong, then it's really hard. So, for a start, it's really important to throw out anything that makes it easier to put them in. And of course, you're right. In fact, it's pretty hard, but if you use the wrong technology, it actually gets a lot easier. And that's the real problem with this. So, um, the time is slightly cut. Okay, so we're at the last question from the internet because we're short on time. The question is, have you actually found um, evil Trojans like that were implemented as a Trojan and not as a debug interface? Yes, indeed. There have been several examples where, for example, the hardware random number generators have been tampered with and the random number wasn't random at all anymore, but could rather be influenced. And yes, there have been actual real-world examples where this has been used. Are there any names for those? Uh, um, th no dialogues, please. Um, so, thank you a lot. You can applaud, uh, but we're not taking any more questions. You have been listening to Hardware Triangle.